In this tutorial, we'll look at the many ways we treat disease. The first aim is, can you describe the different treatments we have developed to fight disease? Then, can you explain how antibiotic resistance develops in bacteria? Very important exam topic, that one. And can you plan for a practical that allows you to test the effectiveness of different antibiotics or antiseptics? So imagine you're in ancient Greece and unfortunately you've managed to cut your arm and like any good ancient Greek citizen you decide to pay the doctor a visit. And the doctor decides to remedy your condition by rubbing mouldy bread onto your arm. Now believe it or not this was actually common practice in many cultures but why on earth would you want to rub mouldy bread onto an open wound? Well firstly it's important to acknowledge that mould is a living organism, it's a type of fungus. And just like we want to protect ourselves against diseases, all organisms have developed some sort of strategy to fend off pathogens. Bread mould, for example, produces the chemical penicillin, which you may have heard of. Penicillin is an antibiotic, a chemical agent that fights infection. And it was completely accidentally discovered by the scientist Alexander Fleming. So many living organisms have evolved chemicals to fight infection. A common example you may have heard of is tea tree. Uh, Tea tree is commonly used now in hand washes, antiseptic washes, and that's because tea tree naturally contains an antibacterial agent. So you know when people are harping on about saving the rainforests, there's a good reason for that. Biodiversity is incredibly important because many of these living organisms contain powerful antibiotic agents or various sort of antibacterial chemicals, antifungals, and so on, which can help us fight disease. In fact, I challenge you to just Google any plant of your choice, any tree of your choice, and just see if it has any sort of medical benefit. I bet you it will. So, let's look at the different treatments available. Now, I'm sure you've heard of painkillers, and if you look here, this is the lovely picture of the sad weeping willow, and it's no surprise to a lot of people that actually willow bark is where we obtain aspirin from, the very well-known painkiller. Now, painkillers reduce the symptoms linked to pain, so they may temporarily alleviate your headache, for example, but they don't cure anything. They don't actually cure the underlying uh, cause of these symptoms. Similarly, there are many cold remedies on the market, and once again, these just reduce the symptoms, they alleviate the discomfort brought on by the symptoms, but they do not cure the underlying cause of the problem. Antiseptics are chemicals that kill bacteria outside of the body. So you may have heard of TCP and Dettol and things like that. They actually can be applied to the surface of your skin to kill bacteria and prevent an infection. Uh, Antiseptics are put in all sorts of um, hand washes and so on. In fact, in the 1840s in Austria, a doctor called Semmelweis noticed a lot of women were dying after giving birth. He came up with this hypothesis that perhaps these deaths were related to the unhygienic habits of the doctors. So he made it compulsory that all doctors who were entering his ward had to wash their hands with an antiseptic. He didn't actually know much about bacterial infection because we hadn't really discovered much about bacteria at the time. But his strategy cut death rate from 12% to 2%. After he actually left the hospital, unfortunately, death rate rose again because people didn't continue his practice. And finally, um, antibiotics, which are chemicals produced inside living organisms to fight infection. There are two types, those which kill bacteria, and they're called antibacterials, and antifungals, which are those which kill fungi. Please be aware that antibiotics have no effect on viruses. You cannot fight viruses with antibiotics. And that's because viruses use your cells as a sort of house, as a shelter. So antibiotics can't actually attack them. Antibiotics can be either consumed in tablet form or liquid form, or they can be injected directly into the bloodstream. So hopefully now you can describe the different treatments we have developed to fight disease. So now let's look at one of the most important parts of this tutorial, a very hot topic in terms of exams, which is how bacteria develop antibiotic resistance. Now any doctor will tell you that our overuse of antibiotics has led to an increasing amount of bacteria developing antibiotic resistance. So this is a massive problem. We are using way too many antibiotics way too often, and that's fueling the evolution of bacteria to become more resistant to antibiotics. How does this work? We'll have a look in just a second. Before we do, just I've put a picture of a crocodile here. It's not random, actually. Um, the reason is, uh, a few years ago, scientists noticed that when crocodiles fight each other, they have sad 
savage fights and rip off each other's arms and so on. So they have these massive gaping wounds, but they very, very rarely, if ever, get infected. So they had a hypothesis, these scientists, that the blood of crocodiles contains a very powerful antibiotic agent. Okay, so let's look at how antibiotic resistance develops. So bacteria have very quick life cycles, so genetic mutations can take effect very quickly on the population. So firstly, you start off with the idea of genetic mutations create variation in the levels of resistance to a specific antibiotic in the bacteria population. So if you look here, this is a population of bacteria, let's say this is colonizing our body, and you can see that they have different levels of antibiotic resistance. So the yellow ones have the lowest resistance and the red ones have the highest resistance. So let's just say we've taken an antibiotic and the antibiotic has killed the bacteria with the lowest resistance. So you can see we're just left with the most resistant bacteria. So the most resistant survive and now with less competition, because we've eliminated the other bacteria, they can rapidly reproduce and take over. So within a few generations, we have a bacteria population that is completely resistant to that antibiotic. So my tip to you is only use antibiotics when it's absolutely essential. And if you are using them, always finish your course of antibiotics. That way you get rid of as many of these bacteria as possible so your immune system can handle what's left over. Now it's precisely because we haven't obeyed these rules that we now have the MRSA, superbug. This is a bacteria which is actually resistant to the very powerful antibiotic methicillin. As it is resistant to one of the most powerful antibiotics, it's very difficult to fight against. Just so you know, MRSA doesn't actually look like that. That's what it looks like. So pathogens undoubtedly threaten our species more than any other living organism on this planet. So here's some good advice to protect our species. Firstly, be hygienic. Yes, always wash your hands after going to the toilet, before you're cooking a meal, before you're shaking hands with someone. At every opportunity, be hygienic. Use soaps which contain antiseptics and so on. It's the easiest way to stop us transmitting a disease. Secondly, and I've already discussed this, only use antibiotics when necessary. For viruses, you can take antivirals rather than antibiotics. Obviously, rest and sleep and eating healthily will also help your immune system fight viruses. Also, if the worst happens and an outbreak actually occurs, countries can always restrict outgoing and incoming flights to avoid a pandemic. That's when an outbreak goes worldwide, and that's pos you know, the worst possible thing that can happen in terms of uh, disease. But sometimes, in spite of all our precautions, bad things can just happen. For example, new bacteria strains evolve that we have no immunity to, and that can happen. If that happens, you know, it can claim a lot of human life. Also, viruses evolve very rapidly. What that really means is that antigens change on the surface of their protein coat. So we need new vaccines to fight these viruses, and sometimes it, you know, it takes time to develop these, and in that time, a lot of human life can be claimed. So that explains how antibiotic resistance develops in bacteria. Finally, let's look at how we can plan an investigation that allows us to find out how powerful an antibiotic is or an antiseptic is. The first thing you have to do is transfer some bacteria onto a suitable culture medium. Culture medium is basically uh, a substance that bacteria like because it contains the nutrients that allows them to grow. So in other words, it's a medium which allows bacteria to grow very quickly. And what we use in school quite commonly is agar jelly, which is made from seaweed, it contains carbohydrates and proteins which bacteria like. So how you would do this is you'd get a Petri dish, you'd pour the liquid agar jelly into the base of the Petri dish and leave it to cool and solidify. Then you would get an inoculating loop, which is just a wire loop. You would heat it under a Bunsen flame just for a few seconds to sterilize it. That means kill all the bacteria. You then dip it into your bacteria solution and then streak it across the agar jelly to infect or inoculate the agar jelly. Next, you need to soak three paper discs in different either antibiotic or antiseptic treatments. But you also need a fourth disc soaked in sterile water. This will act as a control because there's no active ingredient in there, it gives you something to compare your results against. Then you would place each disc so they are equally spread out on the jelly, make sure they're sufficiently far apart. You leave it for about 24 hours at 25 degrees Celsius, nice and warm to encourage growth. 
So this is a top view of our agar plate, and you can see these little paper discs. Each one's been soaked in a different antibiotic, so antibiotic A, B, and C, and then the control, which has been soaked in water. We'll leave this plate for 24 hours at 25 degrees Celsius. Remember that bacteria have been transferred to the agar on this Petri dish. Then when you return 24 hours later, all you have to do is measure the zone of inhibition and compare that zone for each antibiotic. What I mean by that is the antibiotic will obviously soak into the agar and diffuse into the agar and where the antibiotic is, you'll assume it will start to kill the bacteria. The one which kills the most bacteria will be the most powerful antibiotic against that specific bacteria. So you can see here that the diameter of this zone of inhibition, okay, where basically the antibiotic has inhibited bacterial growth. Um, you can see it's longest, all right? So therefore, it's the most effective. You can see that B is the least effective, and our control hasn't managed to uh, kill any bacteria, which is what we expected. You could also be more sophisticated this and put a graph paper behind this Petri dish and count the number of squares to get an exact idea of area because obviously the circle created might not be symmetrical. And if you're a good scientist, you'll always take into account control variables. So in this experiment, to make sure you've got a fair test, you'll need to control temperature. You will need to control the size of the discs, because obviously you don't want more antibiotic agent on one disc than another. And also you'll need the same concentration of antibiotic applied to each disc. And that is how you can plan for a practical that allows you to test the effectiveness of different antibiotics.